Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Yishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting today's show from Hebron. That's right, Hebron itself. I'm in the Avram Avinu neighborhood where our offices, the offices of the Jewish community of Hebron, are located. And my window, God bless me, uh, is right to the Avram Avinu synagogue, an ancient synagogue built in 1540 by the Spanish Jews that came uh, to this town. And, of course, we're on the Land of Israel Network. It's a beautiful day. It's about to rain soon here in the Land of Israel. And we have a very special guest, very special guest for the show today, and that is none other than the legendary spokesman of the Jewish community of Hebron, and also a scholar of the Maratha Machpela of the Tomb of the Fathers and Mothers in Hebron, Noam Arnon. Shalom. Shalom, Ishai. Shalom to everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming on my show. And uh, uh, you are finishing up your PhD in Maratha Machpela. I have the great honor of just a little bit, just a shtickle, a little bit of, of uh, helping you translate some of the stuff. And I learned so much from it, and it's really, it's really fun and an honor. And soon we'll be able to, to be able to call you uh, Dr. Noam Arnon. Today, uh, Noam will be able to, I'll ask you just to spend a little time with me to talk about the Torah portion of Vayechi. This Torah portion is uh, a little bit of a Chaye Sara, a, a Torah portion of Chaye Sara, but kind of the minor one, right? This is the return, that very famous purchase that we had in Chaye Sara, where, where Abraham purchases the tomb of the fathers and mothers to bury Sarah. It's at this Torah portion where we learn it's already been a burial place for everybody else, for Abraham and Sarah, for Isaac and Rebecca. We didn't know that beforehand, and we'll see that in a second. And for Leah, we also didn't know that beforehand. And now comes the section where, where Jacob is dying in Egypt after 17 years of living there. And he says, Joseph, come to me before I die. Make an oath for me that you're going to take me back to the land of Israel. Make an oath. They say that the reason that he had to make an oath because he knew that Pharaoh may not want to allow him to be buried outside of the land of Egypt. And the oath is one which we haven't seen for a while, all the way from when Abraham sent his servant uh, to Haran to get a, um, a, a, a bride, the bride who was going to be Rebecca, Rivka, for, ya- for, for Yitzchak, and that is put your hand under my thigh. What is this business of put your hand under my thigh? What is that? Uh, it's really very ancient uh, type of uh, promising something. I mean, you put a part of your body under somebody else's body. It can be your hand, it can be, it's basically your hand to show that you are under him. You put yourself under somebody else. And and by this, you show that you are under him, that his word will control you. Mm-hmm. His word is is uh, something that will lead you to fulfill this will, to fulfill this commandment. Mm-hmm. So this is a sort of a experience right. in the ancient world to show that, okay, I'm under you, I'll do what you want. Right. And, and you know, no, I'm, when I am with my kids, I've taught them to, to see this. I said, come here to my son and my daughter. I said, come here, put your hand under my thigh, just like this. And you have to kneel right next to the person. You have to kneel next to the person and you really feel the weight. Also, the thigh is where the blood is. It's a hot part of the body. You can really feel that person's person, you know? Yes, yes. So this is how uh, jo- Yosef had made his promise to his father, uh, father, believe me, I am going to do what you want. Right. When Yaakov said to Yosef, my son, please, take me home. <laughs> right. Take me home. That's right. Take me home to my father's, take me home to the place I belong to. Right. And Yosef promised father, I'll do it. And by that, Yosef also understands that this is his home. This is his place. Al- what do you although, mean? although he was uh, very young when he left his uh, father's uh, tent on the, on the very long way to Egypt, he became a king in Egypt, but yet his home, his homeland is in Hebron. Right. With the fathers, and he said, "Ki ganov gunavti meeretz ha'ivrim." I was stolen from the land of the Hebrews. He knew that home is the land of the Hebrews, 
That's a very interesting phrase, Eretz uh, Ha'ivrim. It's an interesting phrase. Yosef, everywhere, when he's in Egypt, he's described as uh, Ivri, Nar mm-hmm. Ivri, mm-hmm. Ish Ivri. Let's remember at that time, there was no Jews yet at that time. Uh, the tribe of Judea did not become a tribe. And there was not Israel, there was Hebrew. So this is why Yosef, amongst the Egyptians, is described as a Hebrew, and we are also, we are also Hebrew, and we talk Hebrew. So this is one of the foundations of our identity. Okay, so Jacob is 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 there in Egypt, and he says, look, I'm here in Egypt, but don't bury me in Egypt. I want to lay with my fathers, which really means uh, I'm passing away, right? Like there's this concept of... Uh, Lishkavim avotai, right? Like I'll to lie with my li- lie with my fathers, but this generally means just to pass away. Uh, I know that there's so some. It, it is double meaning, right? It is double meaning because uh, in Jewish thought, you always know that after somebody pass away, he's not alone. He is with his uh, fathers, with his ancestors, with all the family, with all the nation of Israel. Is there with all the with all the tzaddikim? So this is really goes to double meaning, mm-hmm. uh, and in Hebron I think we we feel it every day, every minute. What it means to be w- with your fathers? Because here in Hebron we are always with our fathers. Right. You can touch the place. So we, this really being very very in a special atmosphere here in Hebron. Right, and what's going to happen is that that Yaakov is also going to mention his fathers. He's going to say the, the, the name of Avraham and Yitzchak come in this Torah portion a few times. And one of them is in the very famous verse where the sons of Yosef are blessed. And um, he says the famous verse, right? The famous verse is Hamalach HaGoyel Otimi Korra. Here it is. This is verse, so we're talking about chapter 48, Memchet, a, a Torah portion of Vayechi in the book of Genesis, verse 16. Hamalach goel oti mikol ra, yivarech et anearim, the angel who protects me from all evil things, will bless these lads, these two lads, your two sons. Vekare bahem shmi, their, my name will be called upon them. Who's that? That's Yaakov. Veshem avotai, and, and the name of my fathers, Avraham veitzchak, veidgu larov bekerev arz. They should be like fish and multiply like fish. Uh, uh, in the land, so he wants to put the name of the uh, of the fathers upon them. What does that mean? It means that he takes these two sons, two Egyptian young, youngsters, Menashe and Ephraim, and upgrades them to the level of the Shvatim. They will be like their uncles, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, and by this. He actually puts the name of the Avot into those two sons. Mm-hmm. And it's very important because remember, they were born in Egypt to an Egyptian prince, Osnat. Princess. Princess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, surrounded in uh, Egyptian uh, society. Now they become a part and Oh, it's an okay. authentic part of the nation of Israel, and they have the the privilege to be not like uh, like uh, sons of uh, Yosef, but to be like sons of Yaakov. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's a very very important step that Yaakov is doing um, to take this part of the nation of Israel and connect it uh, very very tightly to to the future of Israel. Now, Yaakov is uh, retelling the tale a little bit. Now, the the rabbis, the re- the tale of his mother's of Yosef's mother's dying of Rachel Imenu dying. The rabbis are saying the sages see this as I know I'm asking you to bury me in Marata Machpela, but I didn't. Br- you may wonder why I didn't bury your mother in Marata Machpela, and she was buried by herself in Beit Lechem Der Chifrata. However, I'm still asking you to take me the long journey, the, the six-day journey 
to bring me to Maratha Machpelah. And he kind of tries to explain, look, she died upon me. But there isn't really an explanation of why Rachel Imenu wasn't actually brought here to Hebron, to Maratha Machpelah. Uh, he just kind of tells him the, the tale. But why, why, why is he telling him, in your opinion, why is he telling him the tale of, of, of Rachel Imenu? He says, V'ni bevoi mi padan ara, mi padan, meta alai Rachel, beretz knan, baderech, beod kivrat aretz, lavoi frata. Like, we were on the way, coming into the land from Padan Aram, and, uh, and uh, she died on the way, uh, almost at Ephrat, and I buried her there. On the way to Ephrat, it is Beit Lechem. What, what's, what's that story about? And what's the relationship between that Marat and Machpelah, Kev Rachel? There are some explanations to this story. I can give you the Pshat, the geographical and historical Pshat, it's that uh, it was too far. What was too far? To bring a body from Bethlehem to Hebron. And the conditions of that time, it could, um, v- it could be quite a long way. And uh, remember that Yaakov, uh, going back home, uh, did not really know what's going on here. He was on his very, very long way, coming from far away. Um, I think it was a very, uh, very difficult minute for him to lose his beloved wife. He couldn't begin to plan this journey, this funeral right. from Bethlehem to Hebron. Right. And he said, this is the place uh, we must uh, bury him. She, he, it was a very, very, very difficult and sad minute for the whole family. Right. So this is one story. That's how. That's how. By the way, how Malka, the great uh, biblical commentator Malka Fleischer, uh, understands it also, also. That it was such a impossible moment for him that he didn't have the ability to keep carrying her and think of it through. It wasn't like it was an old man and then we were carrying him. It was just this broken moment, and right there is where they buried her. Yes. Now, the sages, the Rabbi uh, Chazal, they have their explanation of Rachel. Weeping for her sons, Rachel Mevakal Banea, she's there on the way where her sons will be going to the Galut, and she's crying for her sons, and this is Kol Beraman Ishma, her voice is being heard very loudly all over, I think her voice is still there, and I want to tell you something, I heard from Rav Goren, the late Rab Rashi, Rab Shlomo Goren Zetzal, he was the chief rabbi of the Israeli army. And I heard this story from him personally, that when, after they liberated Yerushalayim, after blowing the shofar in the Kotel, the, the Tzahal, our Chayalim, the moved, moved the, the army, moved southward, and uh, he came to uh, Bethlehem in the middle of the night. Now there he began to search the key to enter Kever Rachel. He was uh, going around the building and then he heard something falling right next to him. It was the key that the keeper, the Arab keeper that was there in one of the buildings, he threw, the, threw this uh, key to him. He opened the gate went into Kever Rachel in the middle of the night and said to Rachel Imeno uh, from Irmiyahu, Ko Amar Hashem, Min'i kolech mibechi ve'enaich midim'a, Weep no more, Rachel. Stop your eyes from tears. Ki yesh sachar lifulatech, Neom Hashem, v'shavu me'eret soyev. Hashem will give you uh, back your sons from the land of the enemies. Mm-hmm. Your sons had returned to their borders. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine the chief rabbi of the Israeli army is meeting Rachel Imeno and saying this prophecy to her, okay, stop crying, Rachel. We had returned. Shavu Banim Legvulam. 
it's so emotional now. This is the midrashi, the midrash about the Kev Rachel. And besides that, I must tell you that there are several opinions about where Rachel was buried. I personally believe, and uh, I think it can be proven, that the, today, the place of Kev Rachel today is the place of Kev Rachel. And this is the real location of Kev Rachel. And I think all the other opinions um, that do not have historical uh, basis to, to rely upon. Right. Uh, there are a few verses in the Tanakh, not in, not in, not in the five books of Moshe Rabbeinu, not in the, not in the uh, Pentateuch, the, the five books, but it, there are a few other verses that seem to suggest that maybe Kevrachel is somewhere else, but already 2,000 years ago in the Tosefta, uh, on, on Masechet Sota, the Chazal already explained all these verses away and said to you, listen, guys, Kev Rachel is where you think it is. It's in Beit Lechem, and there it is. And of course, you also know from history that, that, that travelers and people, even in antiquity, uh, all the way to, to early Christian times, knew exactly where the tomb of Rachel was, and it's exactly where you think it is. Uh, so that's great. Okay, I'm glad you think so as well. Um, Afterwards, uh, Yaakov is gonna is gonna call all his sons and give them all special blessings. He's gonna bless them, and uh, he's gonna bless Yosef and Yehuda with big blessings. Uh, J- Judah, th- this is where we are today. The capital of Judah is Hebron, and a lot of mentions of the wine country and of uh, of uh, wine produce. And he gives everybody their different kind of. Uh, he also lays out, interestingly enough, where for some tribes like where they're gonna live by mentioning places like Tzidon, or for Joseph mentioning Shechem. Um, the name of God, the, the Tetragrammaton, the Yudke Vavke, comes back for the first time in a long time, and uh, with a great phrase, three, a three-word phrase, Lishuatecha Kiviti Hashem. And this is, uh, Rashi says this is a reference actually to Samson, uh, to Shimshon. And he, and he gives uh, really these, these blessings, which are also mirrored when we finish reading the Torah and Simchat Torah, the blessings that Moshe Rabbeinu gives to the tribes as well. S- similar stuff. But we're going to uh, skip over that part. I'm not going to go through every blessing. But then let's go back again to the Maratha Machpelah. And, uh, and so we, we had uh, uh, Jacob making Joseph swear that he's going to take him to the land. Rashi says very kind of simply, he was the one who was able to take him. He had the ability. But now he's going to make the other boys, the other sons, also be part of this thing. And he says to them, uh, he commands them, I'm gathered onto my people. Bury me to my forefathers. To the cave which is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Why, why does he mention Ephron the Hittite? Why does he uh, throw out... Uh, for just to t- Let's talk about the whole, the whole thing, the whole verse. Bury me to my forefathers. What's the meaning of that? El Avotai. It means take me, lead me mm-hmm. to my forefathers. I, I, I want to, to say something about that. Why does Yaakov had uh, decided to finish... His life, the last words that he said in his life were about Merata Machpelah, the cave of uh, the, the patriarchs, the Merata Machpelah, the commandment to his sons, take me to my fathers. I think that, uh, of course, he could do, he, he could say many, many other things as well. He could say, believe in God. He could say, be good to each other. He could say, uh, he could say very, very many things, many good things to do. He could say, he could say many, uh, many good things. Okay. Yaakov knows that when he will pass away, the era of the forefathers will finish. Now he thinks uh, how this treasure of faith, of um, knowledge, of belongingness will will de- will be delivered to the next generations and to the future. 
How can I ensure that my sons will go in the footsteps of my fathers? Well, this is a crucial moment because you may understand that when the three fathers pass away, a new era is going to come. Uh, let's say a modern era, okay? You don't know what these sons will go through. He finds the, pl the, the, the mean. Take your sons and connect them to your fathers. This will ensure the future. They will go in the way of the fathers. This is why he had chosen to finish his life. The last word and last commandment, the last will of Yaakov was one thing. Remember Merata Machpela, remember the fathers, go in their way. And when he, he knows that his sons will take him to Hebron, not only Yosef, this is why he said to all the sons, not only Yosef, take me home, take me to Merata Machpela, and he knows that they will get the impression of this place, the meaning of this place, and will go with it forever. Right, and 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 also come to this place, all the sons, see it, pass that story to the next generations, and then you're going to have the guy who's going to finally come to the land of Israel. That's going to be Kalev ben Yifune. He's going to know his way to Marat Machpelah. He'd heard about it. Maybe somehow he even snuck away and visited it, but he but he had heard of this place, and he comes and connects, reconnects the Jewish people to that story. By but the here, way, by the way, there are in the apocrypha uh, books. From the second temple period you read it's not in the bible not in the talmud but there you read that all the 12 tribes were buried also in Merata mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what do you think about that um i don't think it's historical truth i think they were buried in egypt mm -hmm. but i know that in legends that somehow reflect the jewish soul not the jewish uh, archaeology but the Jewish feelings, they knew that these 12 tribes belong to Merat HaMachpelah. And somehow, not physically, but emotionally or symbolically, they are also buried with the fathers there. Tonight, uh, the organization that keeps the tomb of Joseph open for visitation is opening up the tomb of Joshua. Uh, Yeshua Ben Nun and Kalev Ben Yifune, which is in Kifl Charas or Timnat Charas, it's got two names, which is a village right across from the town of Ariel, and it'll be open. To, it's an Arab village, and it'll be open tonight from ten to eleven, right on the eve of the tenth of Tevet fast. Um, so, wh wh why does why does Yaakov mention here El Efron Hachiti? Because he knows that someday some other people will claim. It's not yours, it's ours. Right. Like today, you know, when the Arabs say this is a mosque, before then Christians say this is a, a, a church, and Yaakov knows and he wants to emphasize to, to his sons, we had purchased it from the original owner. Mm -hmm. We had purchased it right from Ephron Achiti, which he had owned this, this place. This is why he mentioned Ephron at that opportunity to remember that we are the legal owners of this place. Okay, let's go on to the next verse. In the cave, which is in the field of Machpelah. What does the word Machpelah mean? Machpelah basically means double. By the way, we know today, after our research, that the cave is really is a double cave. This is Merat Machpelah. And then the cave was named Machpelah. And because of the importance of the cave, it gave the name to, to the, the field, field around. Uh -huh. So this is why it's called Sdea Machpelah. Machpela. Okay, good. Asher al pnei Mamre. Okay, al pnei means on the eastward to Mamre. We know that Merad Machpelah today is located eastward to a, a hill that even today in Arabic called Nimra. Nimra, which is as, uh, the Arabic pronouncing of the name Mamre, Chilufei Mem Venun, very. So, this is meaning Alp Ne Mamre. Alp Ne means eastward. Mm -hmm. And it's really the geographical, today, geographical description of the place. So, east of, of Mamre, which is today Nimra, is Marat Machpelah. Be'eretz Knaan. Of course. 
in the land of Canaan, Asher Kana Avraham et Asadeh. Remember, our forefather, our grandpa had purchased this place. It's yours. Don't forget it. Me'et Ephron Achiti from Ephron the Hittite. Now, Hittites were not the big native population in the land of Israel. They're more in Turkey, right? Yes, but they were a great empire. A few tribes, a few, let's say, a few groups from uh, uh, Hittite uh, um, people uh, went down to Eretz Israel as well. But the most, um, biggest, huge empire of the Hittite was uh, north in Egypt, in uh, Turkey. Turkey, that's right. Uh, for a burial property, a burial... Uh, Achuza means more than that. To le'echoz is to hold. Achuzat mm-hmm. kever is the place that you hold forever. Today, by the way, we have the word ma'achaz. Ma'achaz chuki. Okay, of course, legal holding of the land is le'echoz, ma'achaz. Now, here's a very interesting verse. Shama... By the way, uh, the the uh, uh, to those who who the, those sources that believe that Moshe Rabbeinu is buried there, so the Ma'arat Zdei Amachpela stands for Moshe. It's got the acronym Moshe, and here also Shama is the same uh, letters as Moshe. Shama kavru et Avraham ve'et Sara. Ishto. Ishto. Okay, so there they buried Avraham and his wife Sara. Well, we knew that. Shama kavru et Yitzchak. This is the first piece of time, this is the first moment that we learn that Rivka is in fact buried in Marat HaMachpelah. That's right, that's right. Yaakov is completing information that uh, we didn't know from before. And very beautifully, Veshama Kavarti Et Le'a. There I buried Le'a. We also didn't know that previously. That's right, that's right. But the, the, don't, don't forget that Le'a is the mother of Yehuda. And Hebron is in the land of Yehuda. Mm-hmm. So it's very natural that she is buried here. Mikneh mm-hmm. HaSadeh. What does that mean? The purchase of, the, of this yes, field? Yes, the field was, was purchased. Bo, and the cave that is within it, Me'et Bnei Chet, from the Hittites. Three times we've mentioned this, uh, who's, who's the original landowner and the purchase. And that's the last words. That's right. That's it. HaSadeh Me'et Bo. He finished commanding his sons. He gathered his, his legs onto the bed. By the way, do you remember what that, way, the, that means that he that he passed away or I guess is uh is is to, um, to, pass pa- to pass away, but it doesn't say to die. The rabbis no. are very into yes. this idea that it does not he's say alive. that he's alive. By the way, do you remember what Chazal, what the sages said, what the what the sons answered to him after this will? They said six words: Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. What does that mean? Chazal say that they say to him, Shema, hear our father Israel. We are with you. Hashem Eloheinu. Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. Mm-hmm. This was the answer of the sons to the father Yaakov. Shema Israel means uh-huh. hear Yaakov The Avinu. person. Yaakov, they listen to yes. us. We, we are with you. We are with you. Good. Uh, Yosef uh, falls on, on, his, on Yaakov's face. Uh, and he cried and he kissed him. And it doesn't say this, but probably as the prophecy said to, as, as, as God said to Yaakov, as he's leaving the land of Israel in Beersheba, he says, I will take you down, I'll bring you up, and Yosef will put his eyes, will hand on your eyes, as in closes your eyes. Uh, and then, here's a weird thing, Yosef tells the Egyptian doctors to mummify Yaakov. Yes. You know, you, you couldn't uh, uh, take a body right. uh, of anyone right. from Egypt to, to Israel without uh, making sure that he will come complete, that he will enter complete. I don't know. You know, it's just mummification is, you know, in popular culture is perceived to be a very Egyptian thing. 
And then and then it's kind of done to our uh, forefather Yaakov. Is so, that is that the, would you agree with that words? Lachanot at Aviv? Lachanot, Chanutim. That's what they're called mummies? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mumia. Mumia. <laughs> That's yes. the Hebrew word. Achanutim, <laughs> ken. Lachanot. Okay, so then they, they keep him uh, in Egypt for 70 days. No, am I right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maybe By the way, do you remember? Yeah. No, 40 days. 40 days. Oh, no, and then they cried him for 70 days. Yes. They, for, 40 days is the... Uh, what the date that Yaakov was Nifta? And what the date that Yaakov was buried? No. In Iftar, he was Nifta, he passed away in the first day of Sukkot. Mm-hmm. And it gives you that he was buried in Hanukkah. Oh. Yes. And after 70 days from Sukkot, you have 15 days in Tishrei. You have then 30 days in Cheshvan, 45. Then you have uh, 30 days uh, of... Uh, Make this, you, you still, you, you, you need uh, 25 days. Makes you Hanukkah, the first day of Hanukkah, the, play, the day that Yaakov was buried in Merat HaMachal. I never heard that. I never heard that. Okay, that is very interesting. Wait, how do we know it's when, when he passed away? Uh, it's a Masoret. It's a Masoret. Okay, fine. So then Yosef turns to Pharaoh and he says, listen, if I find favor in your eyes, my father made me swear. Saying, I'm dying. I'm passing away. Oh, 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 excuse me. I'm passing away. Right? Yes, because the Egyptians admired everyone who has a grave. And this is why they build these pyramids. Uh-huh. That every great person, every royal figure had a grave. Uh-huh. So this is how Yosef convinced Paro. Uh-huh. This is the grave of Yaakov, so we must take him there. Uh-huh. It's interesting, he says, I'm going to go up. Now, obviously north is, one could see it as up, but it's a little signal like the land of Israel is still higher than the land of Egypt, right? He could yes, have said, and Hebron, and Hebron especially uh-huh. is in the height of about 1,000 meters above sea level. So it's much higher than Egypt. Very good. Okay, that's right. And you go up from Egypt on the on the coastal Sinai Road, uh, El Arish, and then you go up to Beersheba. From Beersheba, a, or maybe or from Gaza. From Gaza, right? From Gaza. Yes. And then, oh, and then don't hit Beersheba. Make a, a, a go east. Yes. From Gaza up it the depends mountains. Where, like, uh, what, what way they chose? Like Shimshon. Yes. Like Shimshon. Okay, fine. I'll come back, right? There's a big concern here that Yosef is not really allowed to leave the land of Israel. When Yaakov was coming down, he he couldn't go leave to to meet him in the land of Israel. He met him in the in the land of Goshen. Now he says, "I'm going to go, but I'll come back." And then the next verse says um, that that they went up, but they left him and Yosef and all the people. But they left the children. Uh, and and they left the and they left the cattle in Egypt in in the land of Goshen. There's some kind of concern that the Jews and Joseph are going to leave the land of Egypt, because at that time, uh, Pharaoh couldn't uh, give up. I mean, he, he had to have him right. to have them as a loyal force uh, and very very important force in his kingdom. Right. Okay. Now now here I wanted to ask you a question that I'm, that was troubling me. It says, okay, that they uh, they came to Goren Atad, which is on the other side of the Jordan. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What do you mean other side of the Jordan? There is no Jordan River in the Negev or down here in the Chevron area. The Jordan is above the Dead Sea. Yes, of course. So where is this Goren Atad Be'everayarden? Supposedly, it's not in the east side of the Jordan. But it's the west side of the Jordan. Even today, <laughs> by the way, some people call uh, West Bank of I mean, what, what the West Bank of the Jordan? Yeah. Even though uh, it includes Jerusalem and Hebron, as there is no any river here, <laughs> no Jordan here. Okay. But the the location of Ever Erden is from somebody who looks from the east side of the Jordan. He looks west. And he said, this is the Ever Erden. Mm-hmm. So this is from the eyes of somebody ah, who enters the land later on when Israel will come from the ah. 
mm-hmm. other side of the Jordan. This is where, this is where, how how they describe this side, the west side of the Jordan. I thought Ever Yarden, Ever Yarden, in general, in our eyes, Ever Yarden yeah, is, is the other this side. But when you come from the other side, uh-huh. like Israel came after, I understand. Ever Yarden is here. So where is Gornatad? I I don't know really when. You know, some midrashim who explain this place um, in some symbolic, uh, some symbolic um, explanations. But yet, I think this is an open question. By the way, Atad, later on, it's a, it's a small a tree that does not that does not really give uh, fruits. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is symbolizing that uh, it's a symbolizing of um, of a funeral of something that people um, mourn about something that stopped to give fruits. That's I think this is something mm-hmm. symbolic in meaning. Okay. Okay, so then uh, they and they did there a big, uh, uh, what's it called? Like a big, um, uh, an event uh, to what's it called when you when you when you speak about the dead? A memorial. A memorial uh, and to a mourning, and they 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 do it there, and everybody sees it. The people of the land. Finally, it says to Banav. His sons took him Arzaknan to the land of Kin, Vigbaru Otobe Marad's de Machpela. Again, they in the in the cave that is in the uh, which is which is in the field of Machpela, Asher Kana Avraham et Asade, which Abraham bought as a uh, as a field, the field, Lachuzat Kava for an eternal burial place, met Ephron Achiti again from Ephron the Hittite. This Ephron, he 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 hit the jackpot with this. <laughs> he made he made a good business with yeah. Abraham. Al he, Mamre. Again, he's strong. Says, he's strong in the Bible. He's strong in the Sefer Bereshit. Right. He really made a he made, he, he got a, he got a lot of play here. This I, I think the Torah. It looks like the Torah. Whenever Merata Machpelah is mentioned, mm-hmm. the Torah uh, explains all about it and reminds. That it's a purchase, the first purchase of the land in the land of Israel, to emphasize the importance of Merat Machpelah to all the Jewish history. Right. Don't forget, this is your foundation, this is your root, this is your identity. Don't forget it. Right. So whenever Merat Machpelah is mentioned, we have to remember again and again and again. When I give a tour, and I've learned most of my touring of Marat Machpelah from you, but whenever I give a tour, I say to people, uh, this is the last thing that Yaakov said, gave him the whole spiel, and he was saying, you got to remember, because there's a mitzvah in the Torah of Egad Talabincha, you got to remember your narrative, because somebody's going to come like a UNESCO. And let us remember that about four years ago, UNESCO came and said, no, no, no. This is not a Jewish building, not built by King Herod. That's not important. It's not on the top of the Jewish fathers and mothers. It's actually a Palestinian World Heritage Site. And the people that are making trouble are the Jews. Israel is endangering this Palestinian World Heritage Site. So to me, that was a great example of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that what Yaakov was warning from. Somebody's going to give you a, a different tale. And Baruch Hashem, uh, in these offices, we decided to fight it. And that led eventually to... The Trump administration leaving UNESCO specifically because of the anti-Hebron decision. So a, a great a great thing. Well, because when you go against this truth, I guess uh, you get smashed on the rocks. Uh, but let's just finish off uh, with one more aspect, which is, okay, the Torah tells us that they brought him, um, and it says that they buried him there. But the Midrash... Is not content with that. The Midrash goes into a whole uh, talk about a final conflict. Uh, Rivka's, Rivka's prophecy that I don't want to lose both of you in the same day, uh, the day that Yaakov was being buried, according to one Midrash, uh, it was Esav, the old enemy, who stood before the brothers and said, No way. Uh, are you going to bury him here? It's mine. And they said to him, no, it's it, it's Yaakov. He purchased it. And he said, uh, no, he didn't. And they said, well, we have proof. And he said, well, what's the proof? They said, well, you you signed the contract. So he says, well, produce it. Show, show me the contract. And they said, well, it's in Egypt. And he said, well, I have all the time in the world. 
right? Uh, and and they said okay, and they sent down fleet-footed Naftali to run down there <clears throat> to get the the paperwork because the Supreme Court and and the 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 uh, ICJ. The International Court of Justice and the ICC, the International Criminal Court, they all want proof and bring the proof. Who owned it first? This is not. And everybody's having a big discussion. But then there was one of uh, uh, the son, one of the grandchildren. His name was Chushim. Chushim means senses, and Chushim he's the son of Dan. But he instead of senses, he's actually hard of hearing. So the measure says that he said, "What's going on?" They said, "Well, Uncle Asaf is blocking," and he said, uh, "That's." He basically said, "That's not right." He takes out a sword. And he lops off Esav's head, which magically rolls into Maratha Machpelah and is buried together with Yaakov or in the, with the tomb in general. And then they bury him there. So, so Noam, as we finish off here, what, 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 why does that medrash... First thing, do you, you believe that Esav's head is down there? Is that part of Jewish... Uh, no, uh, I think this is a midrash, uh, very, very interesting and important midrash that Chazal wanted to emphasize, let's say, a part of Esav, a part of the tradition uh, is also included in our tradition. It's the head of Esav. They wanted to give him a place in Merat HaMakbila, but to say it's a conflict mm -hmm. and we are going to win it, but yet we can adapt some of his character, especially Kibbutz Avem, and to bring it into our home, into, into our tradition. This is the symbolic meaning. And remember besides that, that in the time of Bayit Sheni, in the beginning of Bayit Sheni, the there was example. a big conflict here around Hebron with the Edomites. The Edomians, they were the... the descendants of Esav, and they had made a, a tough time to the Jews here. And this conflict ended only in the time of the Hasmoneans of uh, John Hawkins, after he had a big victory here, all the Edomim got converted and became Jews. And this is how their head I mean, their mind mm -hmm. came into the Jewish place. I mean, the Edomian identity had actually merged, emerged, and became a part of the Jewish tradition. This is the symbolic midrash that describes this process. No, Marnon, I want to thank you so much for being with us to talk about Marat Machpela uh, and here Parshat Vayechi. And, and Parat Marat Machpela is now going to go silent. And the issue of the land of Israel really goes kind of silent from here all the way through the book of Exodus, through the book of Leviticus, and then halfway through or a quarter way through uh, of the book of Bamidbar. And the next time we bump into it is Kalev ben Yifune, who's going to go up to Hebron. He's going to go up to Hebron, and there's fascinating verses there uh, about the story of Hebron. And again, comparing it with Egypt, there's a tension between Hebron and Egypt. Um, and I want, maybe I can, if I may include, as you said, there is a legend that Yaakov Avinu did not really die. And in the Gemara it said, When you see his seeds, his uh, grand, grand, grandsons alive, means that he is alive. What does that mean? It means that when you see a tree, you know that this tree has roots. Although you don't you don't see them, they are buried. And but you are you are sure that they are there and they are alive. Mm -hmm. This is the meaning of the avot yeshenei uh, hebron. They are like roots of the of the nation of Israel. And when you see Am Israel Chai, you know that the roots are alive, and the roots are here in Hebron in Merat Machpela. No, no, thank you very much. Legendary spokesman of the Jewish community of Hebron. Uh, here at the beautiful Avram Avinu Synagogue. You were the person in charge of, of digging it out all the way in 1979 uh, and uh, finishing up your doctorate in uh, Maratha Machpelah. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. We're going to come back with Malka Fleischer, of course, here on the Yishai Fleischer Show. And if you are interested in... Uh, in uh, 
more uh, of Noam are known, let me know. Write me an email, yishai at thelandofisrael.com. Malka Fleischer is up next uh, to talk about also um, a Sarabha Tevet, uh, an amazing fast day that has in it three different aspects. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected. Noam, thanks again. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Is Star Wars Jewish? For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Tune in to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman to find out the answer as he discusses the release of Star Wars, Rise of the Skywalker, and its connection to Torah. A Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense. Plus, an interview with Commanding Officer Adam Nahum, of the 501st Stormtrooper Israel Outpost Unit. At the Shabbos table, you do a Dvar Torah. It's nice sometimes to throw out an image here and there because it, it captures people's imagination, sometimes better something they can relate to. That's Inside Israel Today, every Tuesday on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. The Force will be with you. Always. All right, folks, we're back here in Judea, right? We were in Hebron uh, yesterday in the recording with Noam Arnon. And now we are back in Yehuda, in Gush Etzion, And we have our beloved friend, Rabbi Dani Eisenstock, who is with us today. Rabbi Dani, shalom. Shalom Aleichem, Ishai. And I'd love to, and you're in my, my, my humble home, uh, but I'd love to offer you a shot of whiskey or a shot, uh, or a, a shot of espresso. Not that I make espresso, but just coffee. But I can't because today is a fast day. Today is the 10th of Tevet, uh, and it commemorates really three events. And I heard a beautiful way of saying it from Rabbi Hillel Horowitz in Hebron. He says, look, it's about three different things. The first thing is um, the breach, the, the beginnings of the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in the first temple period. The second thing that we celebrate or commemorate today uh, is, the, um, is the forced translation of the Torah into Greek. And I say forced because translation of Torah into languages is a good thing ostensibly. But this was done by the King Ptolemy, who had a great library. And he wanted that knowledge, that knowledge uh, of the Torah in his library, meaning he wanted to contain it, not that it would, con not that he would be contained within it, not that he would study God's great, you know, knowledge that he imparts on us with great chesed, but rather, no, he was the boss, and he was going to put it in his library along with all the other knowledges, and so he brought 70 uh, Jewish elders, put them in 70 rooms, goes the, st the story, and they all came back with the same exact translation, so it was a miraculous event, yet still, darkness came upon the world. It was a sad day that the Torah was, shall we say, brought low. It was brought low, but that, that translation is called the Septuagenta, or the Septuagint, uh, and but so we commemorate, we fast because of that. And thirdly, uh, the great leader Ezra uh, passed away. Ezra the scribe, who really is the star of the second beginning of the second temple period, he brings them back from Babylon to reestablish Jewish communal life. The second commonwealth is going to be established through those uh, beginning humble steps. And if you think about it, says uh, Rabbi Hill Horowitz, really it's the the theme that connects all three of them is disconnect. The theme, the connection is disconnect. The element of disconnecting Jews from Jerusalem. The element, that's that's uh, Nebuchadnezzar. The second element is disconnecting Jews from Torah or making Torah into a cheap, uh, uh, earthly thing, uh, a knowledge that is contained by humans. I mean, the humans are the bosses. That's second. And the third disconnect, and here I actually helped him a little bit, is that the third disconnect is from the tzaddik. The righteous person who brings it all down, who, who is the leader of a generation, who is a great man. Ezra, in many ways, one of the greatest of all men, Ezra, uh, really brought back the Jewish thing after a great depression, after a great break of the destruction of the first temple, which was probably the most... I, I don't think... I, in order to place yourself there, you have to just really see yourself as a Jew who survived mass killing and you're looking at the 
uh, a temple being burnt and Jerusalem being destroyed and this civilization, the Jewish civilization in Judea being wrecked on, a, on the smallest, smallest, smallest level. I saw that with my own eyes in Gaza when I saw the communities of Gaza being dismantled by the Jewish state and, and us leaving. And I also had the knowledge that this would be uh, 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 this would mean continuous war which we're seeing uh, today so disconnect and now rabbi donny eisenstock we're also uh so we're fasting today for those three issues disconnect from jerusalem and the holy cities like hebron disconnect from torah and disconnect from the righteous man or the righteous tzaddik the righteous person um but today we also have um um this this question of um the question of the diaspora so we 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 there's a tension there between um between ezra's passing away between let's say even i'll go i'll take it back between nebuchadnezzar which means the end the beginnings of the end of jewish commonwealth in in, in jerusalem and israel which means that we're going out into the diaspora uh, um between the control of greece over our area and and the third one ezra who is a hero of taking jews out of the diaspora and into the land of israel there's a tremendous tension between diaspora and israel we see it also in the torah portion we're talking about we're talking about a jacob who 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 makes an who makes joseph make an oath don't leave me in egypt don't bury me in egypt that's not where we're from that's not where we're going take me back to the land and there's a prototype of how the tabernacle is going to look like by the way that the Jews are arranged around the coffin of, of Yaakov. They're taking him to Hebron and, you know, they've got this, this, this holy place there. Uh, uh, and then Joseph says, don't leave me in Egypt when it's time to go. Take me with you. Secret password, pakod yif code. So, so one of the main themes of Judaism in general and certainly of today, the 10th of Tevet, is the tension between diaspora and land of Israel Judaism. And I know that you are also, Rabbi Dani, are also quite concerned with, the, with, shall we say, the plight or the life of diaspora Jewry, especially uh, uh, American Jewry, not especially uh, more than anybody else, especially just because right now they've had these events. Over Hanukkah, the holiday of lights, there was an anti-Semitic attack in the New York area, which is like Babylon, every single day. And then there was a, a march that took place just now, crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, and uh, by the way, there was and yet there was another uh, a diaspora moment, which was this massive gathering of ninety thousand Jews uh, at MetLife Stadium, Giant Stadium. Uh, is that MetLife Stadium, Giant Stadium? Is that right? Yes. Am, am I correct on that? I think it is. Um, to uh, to finish the seven and a half year cycle of learning the. Uh, the 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 Babylonian Talmud. So that's that's why I wanted to bring you in for for kind of to to talk about this tension a little bit. Tell me tell me how you feel about it. Like you told me this morning that um, we can't sell our brother Joseph, and that's how you uh, described uh, the Jews of diaspora. You agree with that? So it's amazing what you're saying. You know, you're bringing it in. You're telling us that we're so disconnected. You know, Sarabatevate. We're fasting. We're crying over the loss of. The temple, essentially, it started, it all started from here. This is the most important fast that we have because it all started from the siege and then it ended up with the Hurban at the end, with the destruction of the temple. And we have to, today, we have an opportunity. We're looking at the Jews in diaspora. We're looking at the Jews in Israel. And we have to say, let's stop this disconnect. Let's stop this concept of being apart from each other, of not being together. And we see our brothers and sisters that are suffering right now. And we see them that they're going through a hard time. And it's our responsibility in Israel, as the brothers living in Israel right now, it's our responsibility to get up and be there for our brothers and sisters that are in America. So, so I want to tell you a story that happened this week. You shan't believe it, okay? Check this out. Very good friend of mine and a listener to this show, very good friend of mine from the New York area, uh, is suddenly in Israel. And usually he would call me and let me know that he's here. But he doesn't let me know, and he just calls me. He's like, "I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm going to Hebron." I'm like, "What? What's going on?" Anyway, uh, after talking to him, he goes to me. You know, there was a story just now in New York area that uh, a, a woman was walking the street, and a black lady came up to her and decked her in the face, and told her, "F and Jew, your time is coming." 
And I'm like, whoa, that's a, that's that's rough. He goes, yeah. And that woman that was hit, that was my sister. And so therefore, and I know the sister as well, and, and I'm close to this family. And so therefore, he he uh, came in um, to start checking out communities here in the land of Israel, not because. And let me let me and let me qualify that not because of anti-Semitic fear of anti-Semitism, not 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 quite correct. More like, okay. The American experiment is starting to falter. This is a great time to come to the land of Israel. It's, it's slightly different than saying like the boot, the black boot of anti-Semitism is kicking me out and forcing my life to be destroyed. No, no, no. It, it, doesn't, it hasn't gone that far. But what a wonderful moment to not let it go that far and rather to be like, this is the moment for me to like, it's an aid to th start thinking about the land of Israel. What do you think about that? So we have to be very careful. Right. First of all, it's amazing. Amazing that people want to come to Israel. They want to make Aliyah. Thank God. But that should not be the reason that people are coming here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. I hear a lot of backlash from people in America saying, guys, this is not the time. It's not nice that you're saying to make Aliyah to, because of the anti-Semitic why, why isn't it nice? Because Israel is so much more than that. Israel but, isn't a huge bomb shelter. I, 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 well, I just want you to know I'm, I'm arguing devil's advocate because I told somebody it's not nice. Right. But I want to hear you th explain to me, why is it not nice to turn to a fellow Jew in America and say, hey, bro, hey, sister, uh, you're facing anti-Semitism. Why don't you come to the land of Israel? Great opportunity and we'll help you make a good life. And we're trying to save your butt there. So <laughs> what, what's not nice about that? Again, when someone is suffering and someone is going through a hard time, yeah. you have to be there for them. Mm-hmm. Our job is to be there for them, and and there's there, and I think America will come out of this. I don't think there's going to be this forever anti-Semitism. We see it's a little different. Everyone's saying that it's not as bad as it was. You know, people are making the comparison to Germany in the 1930s. Again, we have to be very, very careful when we're talking about American Jews. And we're you're talking, saying you're saying be sensitive, be sensitive, but also I think that that we have to also appreciate and realize what a great contribution the Jews in America are making to world Jewry. They're making, you know, they're there for are us they, when we they, were suffering. Are they living a life like like French Jewry? Are they making a great contribution to, to world Jewry right now? Maybe not. Maybe yes, maybe not. I mean, you'd say, but is that why a Jew lives a life somewhere to, to make, like, maybe a Jew doesn't necessarily feel like he's contributing or not contributing. Right. You and I agree totally that we believe that Bezrat Hashem, everyone will be here in Israel, that all the Jews around the world will come here and everything will be awesome. And, and it's happening and it's, it's happening. We, look, we open our eyes and we see the Gila happening. We see the redemption. We see Jews from all over the world are here in Israel today. Yep. But we also need to understand and have a little bit of, I would call it anava, have a little bit of, of, of uh, humbleness. Anava. Oh, oh anava. Uh, anava, yeah. anava to, yeah. be a little, to be a little humble and realize- Humility, a little humility. Humi a little humility yeah. and realize- there's so much contribution mm -hmm. that the reformed Jews, the conservative Jews, all these different kinds of people in America that they're making to Judaism. It's interesting. So you're putting it on the weight of contribution. And I, I hear what you're saying. I, I feel more like I feel more like I just I sometimes want to respect the autonomy of a human being slash Jew that he doesn't want to come to the land of Israel for X reason. And I don't know what the reason is. And I don't know if I have the right to judge or not judge him. I have a right to love him and invite him. Uh, but like, I have learned that, that the invitation to make Aliyah is also a way of saying, I somehow see fault in your life. And therefore, it actually distances you from a, a loving relationship with that person because you're kind of in some place looking down and saying you're you're you have a demerit you're like you have a lower status and that is offensive to people and it causes you to be more like a proselytizer than a real friend and so that's where i'm coming from why i have a little bit less in my like yeah you got to make aliyah right now type of thing even though i would love it to see more and more jews and i think millions of jews could come to the land of israel but there's something in what you're saying that i i i, I agree with like which is like don't always like be like, uh, here's the um, uh, here's the prescription. Here's here's what you need. Here's what you need. I know what you need. Like you're a smart person. You know if you need it or not. I'm sharing with you, of course, my love of the land of Israel. But I, I'm but I'm not going to approach you as a potential uh, uh, sales target. You know, 
I'm not gonna. I'm, I don't need to sell it to you. See, I want to. I want to just love you a little bit. That's beautiful. I love that. You mentioned also that we just finished the Siyum Hashas, yeah. right? Thousands of Jews all over the world finished learning the Babylonian Talmud, and and did these awesome Siyums and finished it off. And just yesterday, we learned the second daf of Masechet Brachot. And it says over there that Rabbi Yossi goes into one of the Churvot of Yerushalayim. Right. And he goes in there to Davin. Right. And Eliyahu Navi waits for him at the entrance. And when Rabbi Yossi comes out of that Churva, of one of the dis- places that were just destroyed, it might be as the Beit HaMikdash destroyed, it might be standing at the Kotel. And Eliyahu Navi is waiting for him. And the first thing he asks him is, what voice did you hear in that destruction? And it's so important to listen to listen to what's happening. Like you just said, to listen to your brothers, to listen to our sisters, to listen to what's going on, to hear what plight they're facing, to hear what's going on with them. And if we have that sensitivity to listen, to be there for them, and to not just listen to be there and, and you know, in a, in a patronizing way, like you said, but also to realize the beauty of the jury that's out there in America. Yeah. But the other side is, is that you're saying, listen, listen to be there for them. I'm not always so sure that they... Like, they're kind of proud. And I'm not always like, I don't get the sense from my from my extended family that lives out there or from what I see in the you know Twitter sphere or whatever that like, they're like, be there for me. It's more like, we're strong. We have our own internal cohesion. Uh, and uh, we're going to we're going to deal with this battle, which which, by the way, is and I wrote an essay about this, which is like they have a, just a different also a concept of governance of, of how a Jew is supposed to exist. It's a di- by the way, there's a different literary genre for it, and there's a different political genre for it. It's called Jew in the Foreign Court. I don't mean that in any derogatory way at all. It's just an actual literary genre called Jew in the Foreign Court. That's Mordechai, that's, that's Daniel, uh, that's Yosef. That's, that's a genre. Uh, and, and they exist within that genre as in a minority living in a host country. And we live as sovereigns in, in a Jewish country facing you know, uh, surrounded by enemies. So it's just like a different gig. And I don't, I don't always get the feeling like they're like, they need me right now. Uh, it's more like, they're like, yo, bro, I got it. I'm taking care of it. And, uh, and I'm like, you know what? I'm needed here to focus in on my, on my issues here. But the, but, but the equation at the end means that there's a disconnect, as you were saying in the beginning. Right. So the beauty is to realize, and this is not something that I've always realized, especially when we talk about, you know, different denominations of Judaism when we're raised as Orthodox Jews, very often we don't have an appreciation for what the Reformed Jews are bringing to the table. We don't have an appreciation for what the conservative Jews are bringing to the table. And there are millions of them out there. And if we want to be together somehow, and if we want to have, if we want to let them have a space here well, let's in Let's explore that. What, what do you mean by, what do you mean beauty? Uh, I, like, let's just be like totally honest. Like, religiously speaking, in the in sense of the growth of, of Torah, literature, Torah, knowledge, I don't think the reform conservative are bringing too much to the table in terms of, you know, that kind of innovation. There is, I think, one field of innovation that one can point to and say that the feminist movement that came out probably from the secular world, the, the reform, secular reform conservative movement more than it did in the orthodox movement has certainly uh, impacted the, 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 the orthodox movement. And, and we just yesterday had a Siyamashas for women. With three thousand women, which is amazing. Uh, so, but like, I don't know exactly what you mean. Like, what do you what do you mean by that? Like, that's exactly it. We're never exposed. You know, growing up here in Israel, I'm exposed. I go there. I speak at their synagogues. You I, speak at their synagogues, but do they temples. come and speak at your synagogues? No. Do we invite reform rabbis to come and speak in Orthodox synagogues? No. Do we have a dialogue? Are we sitting together? And if we're not sitting together, then how are we ever going to get together? How are we ever going to see? Mm-hmm. The plight and how are we get if, if our goal and what we want is all our brothers and sisters to get together we need to start realizing it. and you asked a great question you said what do they bring to the table so a big thing and something that i've learned about is that the reform judaism from what i understand are going back to tikkun olam they're bringing back things that the prophet spoke about that the Nevi'im spoke about you know it's beautiful that we're learning the daf yomi it's beautiful that we're learning it's beautiful that we're keeping the torah and the mitzvot but there's some fundamental commandments that we don't focus on, mm-hmm. which is caring for the world, you know, bringing the world to a better place, 
um, if that happens to be with a lot of different facets, a lot of different things, and we ha- and that's something that they're bringing to the table that we can really learn from. We can derive, we can get from them, and if we learn from them, that's going to really, I feel, bring us to a much closer place. You know, mm-hmm. we talked about SRM as being a disconnect, right? So, so I can hear the voice of uh, some listeners, uh, and they're countering by saying, "Look, Tikkun Olam has become almost a kind of alternative religion." And it's not so much Judaism anymore. It's almost like Tikkun Olam is the religion, and then Judaism is 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 um, plastered on top of it, and not very well either. And uh, and that Tikkun Olam uh, allows situations for being merciful to the unmerciful, for example, and um, and 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 becomes a a um, a way to actually bash Israel and Judaism. And and there's a disconnect on the on the Zionist story as well. You know, it's it. There's a lot to say. There's a lot of negativity out there. Right. There's a lot of negative we can find. Right. We can sit here all day probably, but I think on today in Asarabe Tevet, our job right. is to try to see where can we get the beauty out of out of out of. And, and that's why I invited you on the show today, I Danny. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was, I, I actually wanted to bring that point out uh, here on Asarabe Tevet. I really actually did want to bring that point out. And, and you're right. And you're right. Uh, I want to tell you that that I, when I speak at Reform Conservative Temples, uh, or to campus to kids who are coming out of students that are coming out of the Reform Conservative world, that's actually one of my greatest pleasures. It's one of the greatest pleasures that I have to speak to them. <laughs> I just you reminded me that I spoke at Columbia Law School about a year ago, and I said there. Look, when people call Israel Jewish and democratic, it's really kind of a mistake because because what we really have to focus on is not that it's Jewish and democratic as, as it's some kind of you know uh, home for for the rights of various kinds of peoples. When re, in, re, in reality, what it is is a, is a Jewish ethnic national state defending its ethnic minority in this region. And a guy who's, who who came out of the Reform Conservative world come up to me comes up comes up to me and he says. Is that like a fad what you're talking about? Is that like a is that like just a verbal trick or you really believe what you're saying? And <laughs> I just it was just a funny like moment where like where there was a clash between some of the ideological fundamentals that have been built into the Tikkun Olam aspect and then and then and then bro- and then kind of uh, bro- uh, what's it called uh, spotlighted broadcasted uh, uh, shined onto Israel as though that's the coloration of Israel like there's a distance in in the way we even color the Jewish state because of those different perspectives so there's there's definitely a tension there but you're saying we got to find the beauty fine okay we'll try to find the beauty <laughs> that's it so but more than that how yeah. are we going to make it happen? And well, that's you, you my wanted to make a, you wanted to make some kind of march here in Jerusalem or some kind of prayer rally uh, for the for the Jews of the diaspora, and I think that probably one of the things that you had to be concerned about was, was whether this was going to be offensive. Remember, there's a constitutional right not to be offended, so you could easily offend. Right? That's a that's a word that when I was a kid I never even heard. Wow. Okay, like people weren't like that's offensive, <laughs> <laughs> but. But uh, because because we used to have to say that other phrase that I don't hear kids saying anymore, which is it's a free country. It's a free country, right? <laughs> uh, um, but but you 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 had that idea of somehow um, trying to trying to show our our support. Yeah, we have to do whatever we can. It's mm-hmm. our job right now, you know, to stand together. I, I remember, and I you know that I remember when I was a soldier. And I was in Miluim and, you know, in Suketan and the different things that were going on. Right. We got 30. letters. Yeah. We got letters from schools in America, from mm-hmm. Jewish communities. We got packages. We had people, we had rallies. People were standing with us. Right. And it's our job right now to give it back and show them that we're there with them mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. We're standing together with our brothers and sisters, yeah. no matter what's going on. And no matter what they're facing, we're there together. Right. Um, when I go to an American synagogue today, I really do bless them for continued strength for the continued strength of the rabbi and their mikvah and their and their and their kosher meat and their children's schools uh, and the safety of their houses and lives uh, and i don't even though i would love to invite them to the land of israel i don't pine away for the shall we say destruction uh, of their uh, of their life and their community that being said there is also a sense that there is a steady decline in the diaspora existence 
mostly not because of anti-Semitism, but rather the other side of the coin, which I think that uh, uh, has not been touched enough, which is philo-Semitism, in other words, assimilation. And and th so there's a kind of that's the like that's the real decline of American Jewry's assimilation and the closing of Reform Conservative synagogues. I've seen that all over the place, the merging, the closing, etc. That's like the real uh, you know uh, pernicious devil that is eating away at American Jewry. Anti-Semitism may very well be something that actually is going to save them. God forbid we can't say that. But you can't say that. But remember that 90% of all the Jews living in the land of Israel are here because of anti-Semitism. So, so I'll say that the third redemption, Hashem, we're davening for this. The, mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're in it. We're in it. It's happening. We see it. Look outside. Right. Look outside where we're sitting right Amen. here. We see it happening. We right. see the mountains that are flourishing. We see, we see Jews back in Judea, and it's amazing. I, I want to tell you a quick story. Go for it. I was in uh, HUC. Stories are us. Hebrew Union College. It's a few years back. And that's a that's a reform. That's a, that's basically where the ref, uh, it's it's a it's on King David Street. It's a beautiful building. It's right here. It's here, Mila, in here in Jerusalem, right. and, and not the have, one in Cincinnati. And, and not the one in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, right? right? Yeah, I think that's where it is. Yeah. And and I was there in uh, in kind of with uh, with Gesher. Gesher is an organization that I work for that basically tries to bring Jews together, try to bring a bridge, um, try to make that happen. And we were bringing a, a Chiloni school, uh, a secular school in Israel, high school, to meet Reformed Jews, because in Israel there really isn't so much Reformed Judaism, and they wanted to meet them, wanted to know what was going on. And the Reformed rabbi that was there was from America, and we started talking to him. And one of the kids asks, he raises a question, he goes, it's basically your fault. You're causing assimilation. You know, kind of like we just said a little bit, you know, there's something going on where you guys are kind of bringing it on. And the guy looks at us. And he kind of like just came with a kind of like a, you know, questioning face. And he's like, what? He's like, do you know that most Jews in America are totally unaffiliated? They're not connected to anything. You think they'll go from being totally unaffiliated to joining an Orthodox synagogue? So that's never going to happen. We're out there to try to help Jews that are unaffiliated, that don't know anything about, you know, Judaism. We're much closer to them than you are. Mm -hmm. We're the bridge. We're the ones that they can come to. We're open. We're able to bring it in. Bridges go both ways. For sure. And I, and I understand. I understand that, the, the, you know, there's definitely, there's what to be wary of. And there's definitely, there's definitely issues that need to be addressed. However, there's something there that I kind of blame. And it's going to kind of go out there and it's going to be a little crazy. And I know you're not going to agree with me. But there's a little bit of blame for the assimilation going on in America. I blame it on orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. If we're going to be so closed and so sheltered and so far right, then how are people going to be able to come in and enjoy the beauty of Judaism? How are they going to see how awesome it is to be Jewish if we're going to close them off? We're going to be so rigid. We're going to do things that are, we're going to close off the Western Wall. Reformed Jews can't go to the Kotel today. No, they can go to the Kotel. They can't dive in in their way at the Kotel. Right. First thing, for, I, I agree and disagree with you. I, mean, I definitely agree with you about the. I, I got to tell you the whole Kotel, the whole Kotel saga, is I'm I'm on a I'm on a different side of this whole Kotel saga. I I just I just think that if I see I, I kind of like I'm more on your side of these things, which is like if I see Jews trying to come and pray at the Western Wall, Gazinta, hey, you know, enjoy yourself. I don't have any problem with that. I don't think the Kotel is a Orthodox synagogue. I think it's a national place. And on top of that, the, uh, what, but what I what I get upset about Reform Conservative folks is that like they did open up a huge, beautiful plaza for the Reform Conservative world, but they're like, no, we want the other one. Who cares? Kind of like sit in the back of the bus, though. No, no, yes. no, it's no. the back of the bus. No, side. no, it's the here. You got your own temple. You got your own place. You but wanted. it shouldn't be. We that's exactly what the temple is about. The temple is about being one. It's a place that's yeah, worship. But, but for wait all a minute. Nations. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. But Judaism is not about homogenization. Like there's twelve tribes, twelve ways, twelve pathways in the in in the so Red Sea. Twelve kotels. Then I'm saying so. There's there really are. There's the there, there really is the twelve kotels. There's for those Jews who who can do it, they go up to the Temple Mount. For those uh, Jews that li that are uh, that are courageous, they go to the little kotel in the in the Muslim quarter. For for for, for regular you know Orthodox folks, they have the, the the regular part of the wall for folks that want to have women and men mixed and have women wearing tefillin because hey, here's a here's a here's a here's a beautiful uh, you know part of the kota i don't think that that's sitting on the back of the bus that's that's extreme if you go and see it 
If I've been there many there. times, and it's it's way better than the other Kotal. There is there is what to say about that, but it does feel a little bit like your second class citizen. Uh, I never thought that. that's. A, I think that that's an imagined thing, but I can. But hear it what could you're be saying. because we're Orthodox. We don't feel that necessarily, and it could be if you're. I you like know, that other Kotal. I like it better. It's nice. It's quiet. P.S. One time, one, it was so funny. So something happened. Like this was a Donny Eisenstock moment I had. Okay, years. It wasn't years ago. It was like two years ago. Maybe it was three years ago. I was davening by myself there at the at the so-called reform conservative part of the Western Wall, which is the retaining wall of the Temple Mount. Anyway, so silly. So I was standing there just praying by myself, and a group came in, and they were obviously like a reform, you know, folks. And and they had like nine guys there. And I was just like, I'll just join with them. And they had some different words in their prayers. Nothing horrific. They're like, Elokei Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rechav, Now, that's not my nusach, and I don't like the changing of the nusach. I like the rabbis, the sages, you know. Uh, but but it wasn't like they were starting to pray to, to, to some foreign entity. Exactly. So I was like, okay, come on, you know, big deal. And I had that, I had a Donny Eisenstock moment, which is like, these are Jews, and they came to pray at the Western Wall, and they're here to like, anyway. I did my thing, and they were all looking at me like, like in a way, they they were like marveled at the fact that I was there. But I was just like, "What are you making such a big deal out of it for? Like, we're just a bunch of folks trying to talk to to the Lord of Hosts here." So I didn't make a thing of it. I shook hands and I left. I didn't like do my name is and I'm you know this is that it's just, it's like, just regular thing. Anyway, years later, I was given I was on some kind of panel, and the dude that was on the hard left was a dude there and he was like and he had a whole defense mechanism ready to fight with me you know for my uh, bigoted uh, you know uh, right wing uh, uh, hate the palestinians hate fellow jews uh, you know all these kind of you know slogans that that he had ready to to attack me with which were all untrue but then when he realized that i was the dude that prayed with him there his whole tone his whole tone had to be radically he had to be like well i guess isha is not exactly this thing that i'm ready to 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 uh to decry uh, because because he seemingly is willing to be more you know open minded so uh you know when you have a person who is identified with with uh you know nationalist views like myself and at the same time being more shall we just use a general term more loving so so it does break down borders sometimes yeah totally that's a beautiful story. And yeah. that's, that's what it's all about. Speaking of that wall, three weeks ago, I took the same group. We were going to Isha Torah yeah. after HUC by the meeting Reform Jews. You went to visit Haredi Jews. And I took all the 150 high school kids to this hotel, the joint the, where they can be together, men and women. Yeah. We had a Haredi guy who was with us from Gesher who sang Yushalayim Shel Zahav overlooking the wall. And then all the kids came over, running over to me and they were like, we want to go to the real Kotel. Right. Don't take us here. And I was like, guys, this is the real Kotel. It's the same wall. Yeah. But there's something about it that we have to. Yeah. There's something there. I hear, I hear you and I understand what you're saying. I guess I'm coming from yet a third different place, which is like, I'm not a, like a Kotelist. You know what I mean? I don't. More of a hard bike guy. Yeah. And so the whole Kotel phenomenon is like. I call it the refugee camp. It's just a refugee camp. And it's just like, so you're really excited to be at this part of the refugee camp? And I'm just like, I, I don't get it. And I've said it before. Like, go ahead, have the Kotal. You know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know what I mean? I, I don't think of the Kotal as this, as a, as a super meaningful shrine. You know, Jews only started praying at the Kotal at like 1655. Wow. Because before that, they prayed on the Mount of Olives and at the Southern Wall where the Hulda gates are, and there was a synagogue at some periods on the Temple Mount. And so like the the Western Wall, as we know it, that piece of the Western Wall is a relatively new phenomenon without that much of a historical depth. And so I like, I don't understand, and I look at it, in, and that's fine, it's a great place, and it's a great meeting place, and it's a special and wonderful place. It's, it's great. But it as a location to be like this uber important location is 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 uh, is confusing to me. I don't quite I don't quite connect it in that way. So and let's so, do it. Let's, let's make it happen. Let's, let's make let's make Am Israel 
be able to be there. Be like, guys, the coattail is open for you. Yep. Let's take off the siege. Let's say <laughs> you guys can come. Dive in whatever you want because we don't care. As long as you come here, yeah. we're open for it. Yeah. Not as long as you come here. I'm saying as long as we want you to know. On the other hand, there's an issue about being respectful to other people's ways. You know what I mean? And and so if you're at a business meeting with, with other Jews, then you eat the high standard of kosher. Why? Because then everybody can get on board. So there are certain things and that... that, that 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 you you take to the kind of you you accept the the um, most stringent standard, and and sometimes that that's actually respectful. Uh, and I, I think that if you want to have women and men dancing and women and tefillin and all that, so you have a beautiful part of the kotel right next door. If you want to come in and you know I, I can understand where that where some would be offended, and I know they are uber offended. I'm, I'm using the word uber a lot here. They're very offended. <laughs> Totally, and this is why. This is why. This is why Orthodox Jews—they're going to be connected. Okay, yeah. these Hasidim, you know, the guys that they're the kippah right. suga, whatever. They're going to be connected. They're going to go into shul three times a day. Right. They're connected. They have it. You're saying very simply, use the kotel as a kiruv moment. Not a kiruv. I don't like the word kiruv, uh -huh. but let's use it as a place as to an say, embrace. to tell you guys that mm -hmm. we're accepting of you of who you are. Come right. as you are, as right. a friend. Right. You know. Come as you are. That's mamish. Like you know, this is it. This is you don't have you don't. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to change who you are. You don't have to be different. You don't have to. You know, just arrive. Just now come. That, now that you, and you know, know that you have a place here. Again, if you want to come, don't come. Whatever it is, but we as Israeli Jews, we as Jews living here in Israel, we have to make the place and we have to make this place an accessible place for everyone very good well you you also you know we have to finish here because you also you know spoke the words of the holy, holy kurt cobain and and so and and that meant today bringing that together you know that that sense of nirvana together with uh with with uh Sarabha Tevet, with with uh, without having a cup of coffee or a, or, a, or a shot of whiskey here so say um i also want to say that uh, I brought to the synagogue here on Shabbat. I brought a bottle. I asked Malka to buy a, a bottle of liquor. She bought some kosher Southern Comfort Soko, and 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 Soko has had an, has had some issues of about not always being kosher, and and this Soko had a huge triangle K, I think, uh, and was quite kosher. And everybody here uh, was wondering why I brought that in. It was because of the death, uh, the untimely death of Qasem Soleimani. Um, or as Alex Trayman says, silly money. Uh, and this, uh, this, this Haman-like figure who was responsible for the death of thousands, and we're going to find out that he was also behind a lot more than we even know, and thousands of Jews have been killed, including you know, the EMEA bombings in, in Buenos Aires. They're going to find that he's linked to that. In any case, um, and I, here's a Persian, uh, a Persian Haman who uh, was killed, so we have to have a L'chaim, a Purim, a little Purim L'chaim, and you told me before the show that you heard another rabbi say that since the Babylonian Talmud was finished just this week, the Babylonian Talmud was finished, that it's the Talmud that was written in Iraq, in Babylonia, and Qasem Soleimani was not killed in Persia, he was killed in Iraq. And so the minute we finished the Torah of Iraq, that's, that, that, that burnt him up, uh, the, that the energy of, of the Holy Torah burnt out the, the Haman. Uh, and by the way, remember that uh, that uh, Haman is spelled. This is the Torah of the Ben Ishchai. He says the word Haman in in Hebrew is spelled He Mem Nun Sofit. He says, look at those three letters. He, how do you spell He? The letter He. He He spells He. How do you spell Mem? Mem Mem spells Mem. How do you spell Nun? Nun Nun spells Nun. He goes Haman has a duality. You got two kinds of Haman in this world. Either you're going to be eating the man, the mana. Or you can if you if you reject the mana, you're going to be eating, you know the the junk that that Haman's trying to feed you. Okay, he's going to be trying to destroy you. And if you think about it, finishing the shas is eating the mana, right? It's eating the mana of Torah. It's eating the mana of Torah, and and so and so we ate the mana of Torah, and we therefore destroyed the Haman uh, of our time. So thank you very much for that That's thought. It. Thank you. Rabbi Donnie Eisenstock, I want to thank you so much, and I want to wish you a tzom kal tzom oil, an easy fast and a meaningful fast. Uh, this is Sarah Tevet, and we should be zoche, we should merit to be able to uh, rectify the three breaks, the break in the holy city of Jerusalem and the holy cities, the break in, in the Torah, uh, and the break in our connection to the righteous person of that generation, the tzaddik. 
Those are the three things uh, that we're asking for. Jerusalem is on the way to being built. Torah is is wants to recover. It's in a recovery mode. Not fully, though. I, I We have some stuff to talk about if Torah is in full recovery mode or not. But certainly, this is a time of great Torah learning. And the, the Siyum Shas, I think, was inspiring to many people. So recovery of Torah. And the recovery of the righteous person. Um, that's a tougher one. I'm not sure that we know exactly who the great righteous people of the generation are. But I know that there are some amazing people in our I know time. one sitting right in front of me. Yes. Rabbi Yishai Fleischer. That's right. You, you see that because you see a mirror. Because you're such a tzaddik that you see. Because if you were bad, you would see me as a, as a scary, beastly type of animal. But because you're so holy, you get to see the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the real truth. God bless you, Rabbi Donnie Eisenstein. I keep up the good work here in Judea, in the land of Israel, and bringing people together. So I'm calling. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi Ishai Fleischer. You mentioned the tzaddik. It's also today the yurt site of Rabbi Natan from Breslov. Oh. Who is the Talmud of Rabbi Nachman. Oh. And she, we really connect to the holy, holy Torah of the Hasidut, to Amen. the holy Torah of, of, of you, of Baal Shem Tov. I'm Rabbi Shai Fleischer, Rabbi yeah. Israel. Amen. And uh, thank you so much. It's Blessings, really everybody. More great stuff is on the way, so stay tuned and shalom. It's devastating is the bottom line. Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Don't miss my show this week with Dr. Harold Rode, preeminent scholar on the Islamic world to talk about the elimination of Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani. I believe that both the United States and Israel are very, very well prepared for any eventuality. Only here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Don't miss the show. All right, folks, we're back here for just a little bit more, but we can't have a show without our beloved Malka Fleischer. Shalom, Malka. Shalom. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. I've had an interesting show this week, a different show than usual. I had Noam Arnon. That's cool. To How'd talk about. Go? It was good. You know, he's very, uh, you know, the truth is, is that uh, I, I love speaking with him, but in English, he's not what the same you know right he's uh, awesome in hebrew right that's his that's his that's his expressive tool is hebrew and i'd love to do a pot I'm, I'm really considering starting to do a podcast in hebrew uh maybe once a month i don't know what once a week i don't know but i'd like to do another podcast in hebrew that that would be i think it's time to move over to that um um and then i had rabbi donny eisenstock to talk about uh, the tension between uh, diaspora jury and Israeli jury, yeah, and um, and also about this day today, which is the tenth uh, of Tevet, which is a, a fast day, right? And we all know fast days they go real slow. slow. Fa fast days they go real slow. <laughs> so anyway, uh -huh. so um, yeah, so fast days go real slow. That's yeah. That's uh, I think I'm gonna name the show Bridges Go Both Ways. Like bridges go both ways. Like you bridge something and then like on the one hand you bridge it in the way you want, on the other hand it also goes the other way as well. Right. So uh so it's not it's it's not always simple to, to when you're a bridge you got to know that you're like bringing something to the place that you want but you're also bringing stuff that you may not want or mm. Anyway, oh uh, like a bad bridge. A a bridge I'll give you just one example of diasporas in Israel. Diasporas um when they make aliyah they bring with them their good stuff and right, their bad stuff. Right. right. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know the Russian Jews will bring uh, technical knowledge and, and a great sports achievement and and a certain kind of strength and military strength, but they also bring with them uh, alcoholism, and prostitution, and and pork. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? So, so the, these things come All along. All bad things. Right. Uh, American Jewry will bring with them a can-do attitude. Uh, you know, coming from a you know a real sense of democracy and fair play and manners and all kinds of stuff like that. They also bring with them their you know a, a petulance dumb for West, Western culture, right? Stuff. Dumb Western culture, uh, including uh, absurd absurd uh, sports uh, idolatry and, uh, and and you know uh, uh, the the term gay rabbi is is not a let's put it this way: the Russian Jews could never come up with that one, and the Israeli uh, Jews also. It's a it's an American Jewish, huh? It's an American Jewish. I never thought of that uh, uh, cultural thing. Absolutely. Right, and my, my Russian side always looks at it and is like, that's something that like we could have never like thought, right, of thought of. Yeah, well, so the, so a bridge uh, in in Russia, you know, you're uh, in, in, you're taught certain cultural uh, 
norms in America. And also, you know, we just had a big, uh, a big experience kind of here in the Middle East with the uh, very decisive killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani, the uh, Iranian general. And uh, everyone's talking about whether that was good, whether that was not good, whether it was smart, whether it was not smart, whether it was going to be war or not war. But there was a little bitty article that I saw that I thought was kind of interesting, talking about bridges and talking about cultures and talking about what's okay and not okay in different cultures. Um, it turns out that um, the death of Soleimani was a like a big... Not not only was it a big blow to the, um, what would you call it, the regime in Iran, but it was also a litmus test for the rest of the country from the regime. Meaning to say, uh, Soleimani died, and then he had this big funeral, and there was all this public mourning, and they made it like really, 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 really public and huge and visual. Um, and there was debates about whether the funeral of Soleimani, there was some video that went out, uh, I guess probably also on Facebook, but definitely on Twitter of like a drone over the crowds. And you could see like blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks, like miles worth of huge throngs of crowds out in the street, um, for the Soleimani, uh, memorial procession. And so then there was a big discussion. Is this like a real representation of how the uh, Iranian people are feeling? Or is this just everybody going out to the street because they know that's what the regime demands from them and they're not about to be the guy who doesn't show up? I mean, I mean, if you don't know the answer to that, I just want you to know that in Hebron, we just had a day of rage and all the store owners closed their stores right. in protest. Yeah. And people told me, Arabs told me, they're like, they forced us to do it. Right. They make you do it. So it, uh, I also saw do, on do Twitter. We, do we not remember that only like a month ago, a thousand protesters were murdered in the streets of I Iran? I didn't forget. I didn't so forget. it's like that place is rough. Right. That place is rough and that place is very dictatorial. And um, I also saw, incidentally, you were just talking about Russians. That's what made me think of it, is that I saw uh, a tweet from one guy who, that w went pretty viral on, on uh, Twitter that said, like, don't look at the numbers of Iranians in the street and go, wow, everybody is such a big supporter of Soleimani because I used to live in the former Soviet Union and like you have to know how to step in line and to and to like show support for the regime. Otherwise, it's like very extremely bad news for you. So the Iranian Jewish community, which there which exists, right? There is a Jewish community. It's not massive, uh, but exists. And they also found themselves in this circumstance in which they have to show up for the death of like to show up and show their solidarity um, in the face of a person who's like many times talked about the destruction of the entire Jewish state, which means the massacre of millions of Jews, right? Which certainly these people do not stand for. Um, but I saw an article that said that um, representatives of the Iranian Jewish community went to the Shiva house. They went to pay condolences um, at the home of the uh, former Quds commander, Quds force commander. Um, they took part in the funeral, including the chief rabbi of Tehran, who like got up and went to the Soleimani house. Um, I see this this tweet here from a lady named Marwa Osman uh, that shows three different pictures of different men. I'll show it to you, Yishai. Unfortunately, yeah. I can't show it to the listening audience. Yeah. And it says here, Zoroastrians, Jews, Christians, and Muslims visited Qasem Soleimani's house in Tehran to pay their respects to the martyred commander of the IRG. Now, here's what she says. Guess, pop quiz, is she pro-regime or anti-regime? Here's what she says. A country of multicultural and multi-religious background that respects its leadership, unlike a nation we know. Right, which is like a very thinly veiled dig on the United States in which people really um, have showed a, a severe lack of respect for uh, their leader. The, no, because the it's it's um, when you have a severe lack of disrespect for your leadership in Iran, you die like a dog in the streets. Right. That's also I mean, let's, that's also. What, what yeah. Are we, of what are we talking about here? What a, what a shameful what a shameful lie. What a, what an obvious and what a what a what a great uh, dishonored is for the people who died in the streets trying to fight for freedom and truth it's right like, oh we all stand behind our leadership because we respect it because yeah, these right. are the party line people and the, this is like keep in mind Ishai, that in iran they turn off the internet 
right? So this is a person who's like allowed in. This is a person who's through the filter. This is a person Maka, who's allowed to get. They don't. They don't turn off. The, they murder people in they, the streets. Yes, let's, but let's, all, let's additionally, I mean, to say that this person has like a mutar message. This right. person has a message which is yes. allowed to go out. Yes. From Iran and right. and it, you know it's it's not a coincidence. By the, way, by the way, I just want to tell you as I'm looking at you right now, yeah. I, my eye caught the Megillat Esther a scroll right. uh, container that we have a very beautiful one, and just I'm just like Persian juice. Yeah, Persian juice. Persian juice. Um, a letter by Solomon Kohan Sadeg, a representative of the Jewish community, stated that members of the Jewish community, like the rest of the Iranian society are present and will stand for the ideals of the revolution, mm -hmm. the Islamic revolution, no right? Doubt, no doubt. Um, so everybody is stepping in line. Rani Amrani of Israel's Farsi language Radio Ran explained that it's very important for the minority groups, this is obvious at this point, to condemn the death because they're afraid of anti-Semitism. Duh. He said that often during the protests against Jerusalem Day, which I did not know exist, okay, but apparently there is such a thing, the Jews go out and take part in the anti-Jerusalem Day thing because of fear of being attacked. In their hearts, they love Israel, he said. They're in a situation in which they have to prove they have no links to Zionism. Okay. So we, 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 this, is, this is called uh, what the Rambam wrote, Gerit Hashma. This is when you have to convert. And, the, and, and, and Jews are sometimes allowed to uh, succumb to, to these kind of... Uh, uh, forced conversion things and to be able to keep their, their true right, religion. So that's, I mean, I mean, I don't know why they stay there. Right, exactly. It would be great to it's, just leave. Leave, like get out of there. I don't know. Like this is, it used to be an excuse. You know what I'm saying? Like the Jews... Let's, let's, you not, know, we let's, had not, to... let's not judge them. Let's no, not judge right, them. I, I, don't, I don't know what their life is about, and I don't understand Well, here's it. one thing I want to judge. But there are some Jews that are stuck there, that's for sure. Here's one thing I want to judge, which is that it says here in this article that Hamas leader Ismail Haniya and Islamic Jihad leader Ziad al-Nakala were present at the funeral. So we had, like, some of the most evil people all together in one place. Yeah. Like... That was what we call in Hebrew. Let's learn the Hebrew word of the day. Fis fus. A missed fis opportunity. Fus, okay. You missed it. You could also say it to children like who are learning to toilet train that if they accidentally make a little bit of pee pee on themselves, you go, oh, fis fasta. Right. You I, missed it. I think what you're saying is what I believe in these three words. And they're not exactly politically correct. So brace yourself. Everybody who's uh, overly politically correct, please put on your seatbelt, your politically correct seatbelt. Here's my three-word phrase bomb the funeral okay you got the bad guys there they're all together and they're like oh death of our fearless leader he was going to kill so many more jews and you drop the bomb on them and you finish that business off okay well, i don't know something or something yeah I don't know. That may be a little bit harsh. People don't like to hear that kind of thing anymore. Yeah, I know, I know. It's not that kind yeah. of a world no. where you say that thing. It no. makes you seem insensitive. <laughs> I am, and I like am, you don't care about people. But I resent well, that I'm not a talking bit. about I resent the people that a little Iran. bit because about the leadership. what we're talking about is saving people. Yeah. We're talking about saving thousands and tens of thousands if, of people from these horrible, horrible if, monsters. If, if, if there was an Israel in the time of the Nazis, should it have bombed the Wannasey conference when the, when the, when the heads... Of, like, of why Nazis. do we let these people perpetrate? Right. Perpetuate. No, perpetrate. perpetrate. They're bad perpetrators. Yeah. And they shouldn't perpetuate. We should, we should de-perpetuate so that they will not perpetrate. The thing is about Judaism is that we do a lot of being happy about when... Well, I don't know if this show is supposed to go here, <laughs> but we do a lot of celebrating of like the killing of our enemies. Oh, so it's funny you say that because because a guy who is my, now, you know me, Malka, I'm a little bit on Twitter. I'm aggressive in terms of my opinion, but I'm not. You're less aggressive than me. Right. I don't you say. You don't get blocked. Like I, <laughs> I, I also don't say bad things. I don't things. know why I'm getting blocked, by the way. I think I'm pretty nice. Yeah, but you, you know. I'm spicier. You're spicier. But I'm not. I don't know. But I don't I don't say things against other people so much like ad hominems. Right, I don't, do I don't that. like ad hominems. I don't either. I don't do that. And therefore the lefties, I have all kinds of like, you know, frenemies and, and, and people that and, and, and really in honest terms, people that I am in conversation with from the other side of the aisle. And one of them happens to be a guy who works on the on the high level at the New Israel Fund, which is a which is a, in our opinion, a a quite 
uh, radically uh, uh, left organization. But in any case, I said I wrote to I wrote on Twitter that I brought a bottle of uh, whiskey, right, of Southern Comfort to to the shul uh, to uh, celebrate the, yeah. the destruction of this uh, Nazi Haman figure, uh, yeah. Suleimani. Yeah. So he wrote to me. Wait, this, who wrote to you? This guy on yeah. the on the on the Jewish left, and he wrote to me saying, "Hey." Wait, why are you laughing? <laughs> he wrote to me. He basically was like, "Does it not say that you're that that you're not supposed to cheer the death of your enemies?" I've heard that once before. So right. So it's like it's exactly. So I wrote to him that here's and he wrote to me. Isn't it true that it says in the midrash that when the angels uh, 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 were cheering the the destruction of the Egyptian uh, pharaoh's military in the Red Sea? That God said to them, "Do my my my, my, my creations, creatures. my creations, my creations are are being destroyed. How could you cheer?" And and so that's what he asked me. Mm-hmm. But then I'm like, "But you don't know the rest of the midrash. The rest of the midrash is that is that when when uh, when Haman was lifting Mordechai up onto the horse, so the midrash says that hey that Mordechai also kicked him in the face, and Haman, being a scholarly figure, says." Wait a minute. Does it not say in your Torah, "Ben poloi vecha al tismach"? In the downfall of your enemies, do not rejoice. So, in the Medrash, Mordechai answers Haman and says, "That's when it comes to your Jewish enemy, but when it comes to your non-Jewish enemy, like a Haman, like you, uh, then the answer is the the proper verse, the apl- applicable verse is vata abamotemo tidroch, and you shall step on their high places." Right. As in, trample underfoot their high places as in play the violin on their tune type of thing oh my you know God. yeah okay yeah I'm, I'm sorry you know i'm a throwback i don't I got, know the violin thing took it over for I, me i got it went a, into red you know i got a russian side to me you know i'm sorry that i'm that not is, i'm sorry that i don't the that i don't, that that I don't that. feel right i don't feel any remorse uh, for for you know of course god forbid any innocent people should be should be hurt god forbid i mean that very seriously but Soleimani. What a what a what a what a what an awful awful. That's a that's a uh, what's it called? He's a, a Nazi. A job. Uh, what's it called? Job well done. No, that's uh, you know when they say like that's part of the job that's dangerous. That's right. like a liability, uh, a job, uh, uh, a, work ha- a, a career uh, liability, a, a work hazard. Yeah, a work hazard. Malcolm Fleischer. Wow, uh, this was like an aggressive little section that we just did. You know what? You know what? I- you know, I, I just also uh, opened up my WhatsApp and I saw that my f- dear friend, Mayor Eisenman, one of great tour guides in the land of Israel, just sent out a picture to my uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, 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 Zionist group, my, my Haredi Zionists yeah. group, and, he, and, he, uh, and he, he sent the picture, and the picture is of a plaque, and the plaque is on the old city walls in Jerusalem, and it says, some part of the renovations of the old city walls of the Jerusalem was completed on the tenth of Tevet. Oh, wow! In other words, the very the day of the siege, the day of you know the beginnings of that of the of that siege of Jerusalem is the very day where we fix it. Okay, and um, and I, I I guess that that today is the tenth of Tevet, and there are things that have gone bad, and it's a great moment to right. reflect. It's a great moment to to ask for forgiveness. It's a great moment to connect to fellow Jews in love. It's a great moment to to have an ideology. It's also a, a great moment uh, to celebrate when things are starting to go the other way. And I'm so thankful that there is an administration today that is starting to see who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, and that that and that Israel is benefiting so much. And is I only hope that we had a hand in the death of of Qasem Soleimani. I only hope. I'm that sure the, we did. Some I only hope that Israeli intelligence was able to contribute. That's all. I just hope we had the schut to take out this, the, to hang the Haman ourselves. Right. Okay. All right. Well, all right then. that's okay. nice. All right, folks. I want to thank you very much for joining me on this uh, long and special show with, with special guests. It was great that we finished uh, here with our beloved Malka. Uh, please write me an email, yishai at the land of Israel dot com. Uh, hashtag hang Haman. Oh, okay. Man. That's right. Purim. Okay. Purim, Purim uh, 2020 or whatever you want to say. Uh, or or just hashtag uh, went to the end of the show because it was a long and special show. Uh, well, show- that is a long hashtag. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hashtag easy fast. I know that you're going to hear the show after the fast already, but still. Uh, and Bezrat Hashem, may we see uh, uh, great, great redemptions. One of the ways that you can see redemption yourself is come to visit Hebron by going to one of our amazing tours, hebronfund.org, hebronfund.org. And if you come there, come clad with some techelet 
T-E-K-H-E-L-E-T dot com. Tchelet is the blue string. And if you're not Jewish, you know, uh, bring a flag of Israel. Uh, you could get one of our awesome uh, flags of Israel that we've um, uh, uh, brought down from uh, the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives, or Hebron, and it can come and, and adorn your house. Uh, just go to ishayfleisher dot com and, and and bring that on your trip to Israel. Uh, check out our our friends um, at uh, at uh, Jbrick who make amazing Jewish Lego. They have all the, they do great stuff as well. Jbrick dot com. Uh, and, of course, check out the Land of Israel Network, which has so many wonderful shows that keep you connected wherever you are. You are part of the program, part of the story. Lots of love from the Land of Israel, from the Land of Blessings. Maka Fleischer, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. And uh, may it be good news for the Jews and for all the people all around the world. You know, I heard just a bit of your your last segment, and it was really so much about, like, Jews connecting to other Jews. And, you know, when we talk about, uh, like striking the bad guys it's really so that we can protect the good guys that's right there's no pleasure in uh in the death of there's no pleasure in death the only reason to take any pride in such a thing is to preserve life to make life better for for jews for people all around the world who just want to live in, in safety and security for the persian people who certainly deserve they have there's no reason on this earth that they should live under the kind of tyranny and oppression that the islamic revolution brought on them um, they should be free to live and be uh, like any other free people in this world. And uh, I'm, I, I only, I uh, we only speak in strength so that other people can have strength. And uh, may it be that the the deaths of our enemies are really the death of bad in this world, and the and the opportunity for good to flourish. Amen. Amen. Maka Fleischer, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. God bless you, folks, wherever Easy you fast. are. Easy fast. Stay tuned. Stay strong. Stay connected. And blessings. Shalom.